Well, good morning and welcome to worship this morning. It is Transfiguration Sunday, but it is also Super Bowl Sunday. And so, of course, I want to remind you to stick around after worship and come on downstairs to the dining room for our Super Bowl lunch and silent auction. We have all kinds of soups and sandwiches that folks have made and all kinds of um, items that are up for, for auction. Um, all of those things, all the uh, proceeds or donations that we raise through the silent auction will be going directly to our Friday night ministries. Um, so come down for some fun. There's some really awesome things and services that um, people have made and are providing. Uh, so you don't want to miss out on that. Um, also a reminder that this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, if you can believe it. Um, we will have two services. We'll have a, a brief service at noon, so if you're downtown and you want to come over on your lunch hour, um, we will have that service uh, in the chapel. Um, and then we will also have our evening service at 6 p.m., uh, and that will also be held in the chapel. So please come on out for those Ash Wednesday services. I think that is all that we have for our announcements today. Um, so as we prepare to sing our opening hymn, um, I'm going to call an audible on this. Uh, we decided that the tune to the hymn that's in the bulletin was a little bit too challenging to sing. So instead, sorry Mike, um, we are going to be singing We Have Come um, at Christ's Own Bidding, which is number 2103 in the thin paperback hymnal. That's 2103. We have come at Christ's own bidding. So I invite you to stand and sing with me now. <clears throat>
call to worship. We come together today in awe and wonder before the God we worship. We, we also come burdened with the worries of the world and the struggles of our individual lives. But in the midst of the worries and the struggles is God, our radiant source of love and hope. We worship together today in awe and wonder to worship the God who transforms our lives. You may be seated for the prayer of illumination. God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that our hearts and minds may be open. Amen. I want to invite the kids to come on down. And I see we got the bag down here already. All right. Come on. Oh, it's heavy. It's heavy today. Let us see. <clears throat> All right. We got a couple more coming. All right, who who brought the bag today? Was it you, Kelly? And okay, I thought it. You, maybe you can do it next time. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, here we go. Oh, there's two things in here. Well, how am I going to tie these together? Um. All right. So, uh, what are these? Jumper cables. What do you do with jumper cables? Fix the car. So um, we'll just do a little uh, informal poll. Who here has had to jump their car before? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I discovered as an owner of a hybrid car, this is very important for you to know, um, you cannot use your car to jump another person's car. Like, it doesn't work. Um, so uh, that, was, that was an interesting thing that I learned. So jumper cables, here we have them. So do you know how they work? So you hook one end up, or one, one side up to the battery of a car that's working, where the battery's working. And then you hook the other end up to the car where the battery is no longer working. And then, then do you know what you do? You know, do you know what you do next? Well, yeah. So you, these are clipped on. They're clipped onto two parts of the battery, and it'll it'll kind of show you which. Right. So you first you turn the car on, and then you let it charge for a while, and then eventually, hopefully, your battery in the car that's not working will work again, and you'll be able to turn your car on. And so the power from one car goes into the other car. Now, you know what this reminds me a little bit of in the Bible? So where, where do we get power from? Killian. Right, so while well, we get, so I'm not talking about electricity power now. I'm talking about the kind of power that it talks about in the Bible. So Jesus, Jesus tells his disciples something right before he ascends to heaven. How does it work? Well, Jesus, I'm telling you how the power with Jesus works. So Jesus told his disciples, he said, hey, I'm getting ready to go up to heaven, but... In a few days' time, I am going to send my, what do you think he was going to send? Power. He says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit who will come in power and will make you be my witnesses everywhere. And so Jesus is basically saying, hey, look, I'm going up to heaven, but I'm about to jumpstart you with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to give you all of the power so you can be strong and courageous. So you can be bold. You, yeah, you can go back to her if you want to. That's okay, Kelly. But you will be strong, and you will have the power of God with you. So next time you hear the Holy, about the Holy Spirit, I want you to think about jumper cables. And think of yourself like 
you're hooked up to the Holy Spirit through these jumper cables, and the Holy Spirit is going to give you all kinds of power and energy and strength and bravery. All right, um, I'm going to set these over here, Killian, okay? And you can pick them up now or later. Um, all right, so in a minute, you all are going to be able to go to Children's Church. But first, before we do that, who would like the bag this week? I saw your hand first. All right. Well, let's pray. You all can repeat after me. All right. Dear God, thank you for your power through your Holy Spirit. Help us to be brave. Help us to be confident. And help us to be sure of who we are in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks, y'all. You can go with uh, Miss Brittany over there. Today's scripture comes from Mark. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone but him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit to them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when it comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves and he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling light such as no one on earth could brighten them and there appeared to them Elijah with Moses who were talking with Jesus then Peter said to Jesus rabbi it is good for us to be here let us set up three tents one for you one for Moses and one for Elijah he did not know what to say for they were terrified then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud were, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for the gift of this day, for your presence amongst us, and we ask that you would help us to see, to understand, to know who you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Well, today is Transfiguration Sunday, which is also the day um, that I think of the great laundry miracle, where Jesus is suddenly wearing clothes that are so white, so clean, that like not even any bleach on earth could get them that white. And, and when I think about Jesus in this passage, and I think about, wow, that must have really been dazzling white, because... Um, I don't know about you, but for those of you who have small children or you remember the days when you had small children, they like to get clothes really dirty. Gus, in particular, has an affinity for mud puddles. And so he's very, very good at getting his clothes extra dirty. And it doesn't matter how many times I wash them, whatever I do to put in it or to try to get them clean, like they will never, ever be even remotely close to dazzling white. Like, they're still just, his white clothes when they get dirty, they're still kind of just like a dingy, off-white, grayish color that I can tell, no matter what, will never be dazzling white. So we come to this story of this, this transfiguration, this moment where Jesus is up, on the mountaintop with two of his disciples, and he is transfigured before them. Now, this is like the high point in Mark's gospel. Thus far, we've, we've been in the first half of Mark's gospel as we've seen these um, miracles and teachings of Jesus, and we've had this peculiar thing happening over and over again where he says to the disciples, look, don't tell anyone, or the people he's healed, don't tell anyone about who I am. Well, here, this transfiguration story, it's like the climax of Mark's gospel. This is like a moment where not just Jesus is transfigured, but really the whole story and the whole understanding of who Jesus is as the Messiah is transfigured. Up until this point, we've seen a lot of miracles. We've seen exorcisms. We've seen healing of the the sick. We've seen people restored to community. But only in this chapter, in the end of chapter 8 that we heard today and and in chapter 9, we begin to hear about Jesus in a more significant way. We begin to hear about Jesus not simply as the miracle worker, the healer, the teacher, but we begin to hear about Jesus, the one who will suffer death, the one who will experience pain and suffering. And then we hear the Jesus who is transfigured, who stands before his disciples in glory. You know, when we try to introduce ourselves to other people, we're always trying to find succinct ways to talk about who we are. You know, usually it'd be like, you know, hey, my name's Cindy. And we're like, usually the, the first thing will be like, well, what do you do? Oh, I'm a pastor. Or like, you know, I'm a mom. I'm a spouse. We have these things that we default to when we're talking about our identity. When, when we're looking at the identity of Christ as the Messiah, there are many things that we could say about what this means. But I think there are three aspects of Jesus' identity as Messiah that we really see in this passage that we've heard today. It's like this microcosm of, of, of this greater identity of who Jesus is. So when Peter, Peter confesses Jesus as the Messiah at the beginning of the passage, it's very possible that he still has in his mind, like, Jesus is the great teacher. Jesus is a rabbi or a prophet of God. And surely Jesus is a prophet of God. For what is a prophet? A prophet is one who speaks on behalf of God. A prophet is one who teaches and who challenges. And we see this throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Hebrew scriptures, the stories of the prophets as they are sent forth by God to proclaim messages of sometimes doom and gloom, sometimes of challenge, sometimes always trying to call God's people back on track. But we have Jesus as the prophet. But then we have two other pieces of Jesus' identity that we really begin to understand 
in today's passage. And that is that Jesus is not only prophet, but Jesus is also priest, and Jesus is also king. So right after Peter confesses Jesus is the Messiah, did you notice what he does? He immediately starts talking about his death. He immediately starts talking about what is to come. And Peter's like, no, dude, don't even say such things. Jesus, like, that's, you can't talk about that. No, that will never happen. Like, over my dead body am I going to see that happen to you? And Peter says to him, get behind me, Satan. Your mind is not set on the things of God, but the things of people. You see, for Jesus... A key piece of his identity is not only that he is a teacher, a prophet, one speaking the words of God and enacting the words of God in the community, but he also knows that his identity is ultimately linked to his death. Now, when we look at priests, in the context of the Hebrew scriptures, in the context of the people of Israel, the priest was there to stand as an intermediary between human beings and God. The priest would oversee the rituals at the temple. The priest would oversee the sacrifices that were made. The high priest was the one who would enter into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement to make atonement for the sins of all of the people. But ultimately, when we're thinking about the priesthood in the Old Testament, there was always this idea of sacrifice, this idea of being an intermediary. And so when Jesus says to Peter and to the other disciples, look, I am going to undergo suffering and death, he's pointing to the fact that there is something more than just being a teacher. He's something more than just a teacher. That he is, in fact, going to be standing in the place between life and death for all of humanity. That Jesus is going to receive death at the hands of humanity, at the hands of ambition and greed and empire, and that he is going to stand in that place between life and death and make a bridge for us to something new. Jesus is not just a prophet. He's not someone who just teaches. But Jesus is also not just a priest. He's not somebody who only sort of stands in that intermediary position and, and helps to reconcile us to God. The third thing that we see in this story is that Jesus is, in fact, king. Now, we don't really live in a day and a time of kings, you know, other than, you know, if you, like, watch the, the crown and, uh, you know, thinking about, like, the monarchy that exists in certain places that's not a true monarchy. Um, it's, you know, there's government, but then they're kind of figureheads, and there's all kinds of strange relationships between monarchies and, and government. But in Jesus' day and time, kings, rulers were the way of the world. And so when we see now this moment of transfiguration, when Jesus is up on the mountaintop, we recognize this third piece of Jesus' identity. Jesus is king. What does it mean that Jesus is king? Well, a king is a sovereign, sovereign over all areas and aspects of life of his subjects. The king is the one responsible for leading, for the well-being, for making sure that everyone is provided for, cared for, that everyone is treated justly, or that's what a king should be. Of course, we know from history and we know from what happens time and again in the Old Testament that the kings were not so just, not so good. They had authority but they did not use it for the sake of their people, but rather for the sake of themselves. But here, we see Jesus on this mountaintop, transfigured, bright and shining as the sun. 
And in this moment, as we're readers today, and as the disciples would have seen looking back upon this moment, that this was a foreshadowing of the resurrection, of the proclamation that Jesus would in fact have authority over even death itself. This is a foreshadowing of the resurrection and of the life that is to come, and that Jesus is the king over everything that is. And so in this passage today, we have this snippet that points to these three different pieces of Jesus' identity. He is the prophet, the one who teaches, who speaks on behalf of God. Jesus is the priest, the one who stands in that chasm between us and God and builds a bridge, makes a way. And Jesus is the one who is, in fact, king over all of us. Now, those are all terms that we don't necessarily use in our regular vernacular today. But ultimately what it means is Jesus teaches us. Jesus wasn't only some good moral teacher. And yes, while he teaches us and we should hear his lessons and live by what he teaches us, that's not all that it means to be a Christian. Jesus, too, is, is the priest, the high priest that, that helps to bridge us to God. Jesus even stands in the chasm of death and stretches out his arms to bring us to him. But Jesus isn't simply, you know, in some, some Christian circles, being a Christian is just about recognizing that Jesus is a sacrifice for our sin and atonement, and that we just need to accept that sort of divine transaction that takes place. Well, Jesus is not just a priest. He's not just some transaction that occurs between us and God. And Jesus is king. Jesus is the one who, who is at the head of everything that we are every aspect of our life, and that Jesus is ultimately the one who has authority over even death itself. And he opens up life to all of us. This is what the story of the transfiguration is meant to remind us of. But one final thing that I think about the transfiguration that I don't want us to overlook or miss I said when I first come to the story, I always think of the great laundry miracle, that Jesus' robes are as dazzling as the snow. But here's the thing. They would have had to have been transfigured from something else. You see, Jesus, Jesus, his clothes, his body, they were dirty. Because he was down in the muck of life with all of us. There was something that needed to be transfigured. If Jesus' robes were transfigured, that meant that they were messy, that they were not dazzling, that they were not perfect. But that Jesus was getting messy alongside his disciples, alongside the crowds that followed him. He wasn't like some king or ruler who would like sit in his chariot and let other people do his work for him and be like, I must remain above and pristine. No, that is not who Jesus the Messiah is. That's not who Jesus the prophet is. That's not who Jesus the priest is. That's not Jesus. That's not who Jesus the king is. Even with all three of those pieces of his identity, Jesus transforms those pieces into one who gets down and dirty with us as human beings. This is what we proclaim at Christmas. This is why we talk about the incarnation of Jesus, that Jesus comes down from his place. And we hear this in this hymn in Philippians 2. He did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Rather, he humbled himself. He emptied himself out, taking the form, and in the Bible it says, a slave, a servant, 
a human being and becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, Jesus, we have this glimpse of this transfigured person. But really, what that does for me is it highlights that Jesus didn't carry himself at that level in his life and his ministry among us. He got down into the muck, into the pain, into the hurt, and into the messiness of life. And what the transfiguration ultimately tells us is that Jesus... Jesus has the ability to transform, to transfigure even the worst, messiest, painful stuff of our life that we cannot see our way out of into something that can and will be beautiful. Now, the transfiguration, it lasts not very long. You know, Peter and James are up there, they see Jesus shining and they say, oh! Hey, and there's Elijah and Moses, law and prophets right there. We're going to build tents for the, for the three of you. And God says to, says to them, um, no, no. This, Jesus, is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. In other words, he is the one who is transforming and transfiguring the ways that have been into something brand new. And you, too, will be transfigured into something brand new. Jesus is prophet. Jesus is priest. Jesus is king. But even in the loftiness of what we might think of when we think of those titles, Jesus showed us that he comes down to where we are. Gregory of Nazianzus, one of the early church fathers, he wrote, that which Christ did not assume, he did not redeem. In other words, Christ came down and was with us in our mess in every single way. And in doing so, in being one with us in all of our mess, in all of our pain, in all of our hurt, Christ does, in fact, redeem all of those things. When I look at my pile of kid laundry sitting at the top of the stairs going down to the basement, I know that no matter what, those will never be transfigured into purely clean and vibrant clothes but the good news is that no matter how messed up my life is no matter how much I'm struggling or suffering or hurting or I've made mistakes that ultimately Christ can transfigure me and Christ can transfigure you that's why this story is important it shows us a glimpse of who Jesus is and what Jesus can and will do. So may we hear this story. May we hear these words. May we see the light that is Jesus and allow him to transfigure our hearts. Amen.
you join me in the prayers of the people? Gracious and loving creator, on this Transfiguration Sunday, we come before you with hearts filled with awe, recognizing the transformative power of your presence in our lives. As we gather in worship, we lift up our prayers for the world, trusting in your boundless love and mercy. For the church, your body on earth, we pray for transfiguration. May we be a shining light, reflecting the radiance of your truth and grace. Empower us to be agents of transformation, breaking down barriers and extending hospitality to all, embracing the diversity that reflects your image. Lord, in your mercy, for the leaders of nations, grant them wisdom and discernment. Transfigure their hearts to prioritize justice, peace, and the well-being of all people. May they be guided by compassion and work tirelessly for the common good, fostering harmony among nations. Lord, in your mercy, for those who are marginalized and oppressed, we lift our voices in solidarity. Transfigure systems of injustice and inequality. Grant strength to those who suffer, that they may experience the comforting embrace of your love. Inspire us to be advocates for justice and equality in our communities. Lord, in your mercy. For the healing of the earth, our home, transfigure our stewardship. Help us to recognize the sacredness of creation and the interconnectedness of all living things. Guide us in caring for the environment with love and responsibility, that future generations may inherit a world teeming with life. Lord, in your mercy. For those in need of physical, emotional, or spiritual healing, we ask for your transformative touch. Bring comfort to the sick strength to the weary, and hope to the despairing. May your healing power flow through the hands of caregivers and the support of loving communities. Lord, in your mercy. On this Transfiguration Sunday, may the brilliance of your love illuminate our hearts and minds. Transform us, Lord, into vessels of your grace that we may reflect your light in the world. God of all, hear our prayers, spoken and unspoken, as we offer them up now. Israel and Gaza. In the presence of God, alongside Jesus Christ, and with help from the Spirit, may we go into this week to live out our prayers through our lives. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In a few moments, we will gather together at the communion table, which is one place where Jesus transfigures us. When we pray the prayer, we pray not only that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on the bread and on the cup, but also on us, the body of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ. And so today, as we come to this table, may we recognize that God is indeed working in our midst when we share together. And so I invite us now as we prepare to come to the table to pause in silent prayer. Maybe there's some things that you need to lay down at the feet of Jesus that you need to let go of, leave behind. Maybe there are things that you need to ask forgiveness for. Maybe there are things that God just simply wants to say to you in the stillness of your heart. And so let's pause now and pray. God, we thank you that you love us and that you always receive us with open arms. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you that you help us to let go of things that we can't seem to loosen our grasps upon. Oh God, work in our hearts and our minds this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are a forgiven and we are a reconciled people. And so I invite you now to stand where you are and to offer one another a sign of God's peace and love.
you can be seated. And at this time, I invite the ushers to come forward. And this morning, as we receive our offering, would you pray that God would use these gifts, that God would guide us for the sake of our community, that we might be the body of Christ for the world.
things come from you, O God, and so now we give back to you that which is already yours. Bless the gift and the giver in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated. As we gather around this table, we are reminded of God's goodness and God's presence with us. We remember that throughout history, even when we've screwed up, when our love has failed, God, your love has remained steadfast toward us, never wavering, never failing. And so we give you thanks that you bring us together week in and week out to sit at your table, to share in your company. And just as Jesus gathered with his disciples on the night before he died and he took bread gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Whenever you do it, do it in remembrance of me. We remember that supper. And after it is finished, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. So God, pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Transfigure our hearts, our minds, and our whole selves that we may be one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world that we might strive together to point to your kingdom until we are all gathered around your heavenly banquet table. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for us. This is the blood of Christ, shed for us. This table is Christ's table. It's not St. Mark's table, it's not the United Methodist Church's table, it's Jesus' table. And the only prerequisite that Jesus has for you to come is that you have the desire to come. And Jesus says that he will meet us here. So when it comes time to come forward, you'll come down the middle aisle and you'll receive a piece of bread from me. If you would prefer to dip your bread into the cup and receive in both elements that way, then you can come to the server on my left. If you would prefer to receive a, a small cup of grape juice, then you may come to the server on my right. And when you have finished with your cup, there is a basket with a napkin over to the front here where you may put your discarded cup. We do also have this basket up on the chancel area. If you feel so led to put a dollar or two in there, the money that's collected in that basket every week goes into our emergency assistance fund, which we use to help folks with uh, utilities, rent, um, as much as we possibly can. And there is a great need in our community, Susan can attest to it, that we get multiple calls every day of people needing assistance. Um, so if you feel so led, that basket is there every single week. And anything that you give is very much appreciated by our community. So at this time, I invite those who are to assist me to come.
right? Oh God, we thank you for bringing us to your table, for meeting us here, and for nourishing us with your very self. May it transfigure our hearts and our lives that we may go into this week as people reflecting your goodness and your grace to the world around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand now and join in singing our closing hymn, Christ Whose Glory Fills the Skies? presence made a difference in worship today. I hope you stick around for the Super Bowl lunch and auction downstairs. I'm going to give a couple of words of instruction up here. Um, so you're welcome to go ahead and head down right as we dismiss from worship. Um, you can go ahead and start bidding on the silent auction items. You'll find bid sheets out there by each of those items. Um, we'll, we'll let the bidding continue on through the eating, um, and then we'll see who, who wins what. Uh, the, for the food, when you go down, probably give a couple minutes, because we're going to want people to be able to get situated, but you will go through the kitchen um, to get your soups and sandwiches. The plates and the bowls are in there. The places at the seats already have napkins and spoons. Um, you'll see where the drinks are. And um, so just give a couple minutes before you start going through the line to let folks get down there and get situated. Who are going to be helping make sure things go smoothly in the kitchen. But you can start bidding on the um, items right away. So again, please stick around. It's going to be fun and tasty. And I'll go ahead and um, bless, bless the food while we're all gathered here together. God, we thank you for this day, for this worship together, and we pray that you would extend this time of family being with one another um, in our lunch and our meal. We thank you for all who prepared it for us, who have been busy getting things ready. We thank you for the ways in which you remind us that you show up in our midst again and again and again, whether it's in worship, whether it's in a shared meal. We know that you are here with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I invite you now to go with this blessing. May we all know and experience the transfiguring grace of Jesus Christ. And may we go with the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.